everybody, Justin here with episode 4 of the Rune Wars Battlecast, where I'll be taking you through a game between the Latari and the Waikar armies. This game includes some devastating choke points, some narrow outplays, and some shifty movements from the Latari that we've uh, come to know them for. So sit back, relax, and uh, let's begin. So before you is my army layout as the Waikar player. And I decided to go for something a little bit different. Uh, this was definitely inspired by the uh, Wycar player at the Worlds uh, that happened recently, where he actually um, ran two six blocks of archers uh, supported by Maru, I believe it was, or maybe it was two four blocks. Um, and mine's kind of like a budget build because I only have six archers, so Maru uh, doesn't really he can't add trays to their existing formation, uh, but when they lose trays, he can add to their uh, formation. So anyway, they've got Fire Rune, they shoot at an initiative of four with the Raven, uh, Raven Standard Bearer, and they have uh, the Close Quarters targeting uh, in case they get engaged upon. Uh, in the previous game with my opponent, his Latari uh, Leonox, Leonox Riders were just bearing down on my archers and it was basically like Benny Hills all across the map. I mean, they didn't really get to shoot. So with this upgrade, obviously, uh, if they if they engage, I mean, they can still deal some damage. Uh, Maru's there just to basically be a resurrection engine. Uh, the Death Knights are a force to be reckoned with here. Extremely expensive. I mean, what is that, 56 points for a 4 tray? I mean... I don't know if I think this build is the best for them, but it's certainly scary. Uh, but if you lose them, I mean, it's a quarter of your army, so, you know, you'll see how it pans out here. I think it's particularly effective against the Latari because their Scions have armor, their Leonks have armor. Um, so, you know, most things you engage with are going to be uh, easy to muck up. And I kind of view the Death Knights as a bit of a um, anti-infantry kind of like counter engaging just with their late movements and, and reform ability so and then I have two carrion lancers who are speed bumps again uh, I think this speed bump meta uh, is definitely influenced from the world's list we saw I mean uh, Ben Fox the guy who won he just had the scions as speed bumps and uh, I mean for 15 points the lancers are excellent uh, at doing just that so I definitely credit him for kind of bringing that to the light. Uh, it's not something I had totally considered up until this point. So my opponent's list playing the Latari is also 199 points, and similarly to my Carrion Lancers, he also has the uh, Speed Bump Scions there with no upgrades. Um, now he does have a, an interesting build, uh, again using that simultaneous order rallying Starling combo, but this time with the Verdant Sorceress, and she has a Overgrowth um, 2, so allows two Overgrowth tokens, and she allows you to um, uh, remove Banes from your uh, allied forces who are within range 1 to natural runes of a Overgrowth terrain. Uh, two Banes, actually, so definitely a good counter to, um, you know, the Wycar who apply a lot of Blights. Um, but also the Rallying Starling is good for um, removing Banes or um, refreshing uh, upgrade cards. He has a... Oh, I will just mention actually with the Deepwood Archers is their four block units are really cool. Um, as a Y card player, I'm not totally thinking about this all the time, but there's two formations for the uh, four block and one of them includes a champion, uh, which is really cool. Uh, that's the kind of flexibility that you I guess expect in elves, they're kind of shifty. So I think that's cool having two variations of a four formation. Um, anyways, six block of Deepwood Archers has the Blackthorn Assassin, which is again a cool upgrade. It has that two wounds on it, so it's two accuracy tokens to take out, and they have the Tempered Steel. And they have the Support Scion, and uh, the thing that's cool about the Support Scion is it can be placed in the back rank of your unit. And, you know, it's, I guess it's debatable, but in my opinion, I think this is a really cool feature. And um, because the Scion has uh, armor based on stable runes, it can have three armor, and you can put it in the back rank. And what it does is, 
if you have a 3x3 three three unit of archers, your opponent can kill off, you know, the back two side ranks, but then they have to work through that scion. And depending on what they're attacking it with, it may take some time to get through the scion. All the while, you're preserving your three threat at the front. Obviously, you don't have, you'll lose some rerolls, but the elves do have, or the archers do have precise. So you kind of have that built in reroll. And um, you'll see in this game that the support scion was surprisingly effective. And um, I wish that the carrion lancers could be placed in the back row anyway. Uh, he has uh, Aliana, and she has the ambush predator. And this card's pretty cool, I mean, I was kind of hoping he was going to bring Megan, uh, but the Ambush Predator is annoying because obviously I can't shoot it with my archers, and they're certainly the primary damage dealers of my army. And lastly, he has the Leonx Riders who have the Raven Tabard, so they can act uh, quicker with their movements. And admittedly, my opponent um, misses out on this a few times, but, uh, you know, it's all learning, and... I'm not totally, uh, I mean, I didn't really think about it either, but I'm not sure if I would have told him if I had thought about it. I mean, who knows? <laughs> now, he has Triumphant Cry, and this is really a cool card because the Leonx, um, I, I kind of think of them as like a, they're like a, a lightning strike force. So, you know, if you can keep moving, you know, the shifty ways the Lotaris do, the, I think the more effective they are. And so Triumphant Cry just allows them to tee off their next attack uh, next turn when they kill something so good good um good pick by him and of course the moment of inspiration for that extra white dice so for setup um some interesting choices here um you know no more just like head to head or whatever uh my opponent picked the oblique formation uh he won the coin flip so he chose oblique formation and he chose the blue side uh, which is interesting. And so our terrain choices you can see here, and they're pretty big pieces of terrain for the most part. And so he, uh, I was kind of thinking to myself, you know, the other choices for um, the objectives were bounty and supply raid. And I didn't want to pick supply raid because you have to place the tokens, which are worth points, around his deployment zone. And he would have obviously just I would have had to have placed them all around his, and he would have just picked up the tokens and scored a lot of points. Um, and being in such a defensive position with archers galore, I mean, it just was a bad... it would have been bad. So I chose uh, the Confluence of Magic, and in retrospect, this was dangerous. Uh, my rationale was I just didn't want objective tokens, like I didn't want there to be any points aside from the armies. Um, but I should have just picked Bounty and put it on, you know, my Morrow unit in the back. Would have been as equally effective, because uh, by taking the Confluence of Magic, the runes don't change during the game. So that initial cast is so important, and as we'll see, I'm very fortunate in that it turns out my way. But if it didn't, I mean, well, this game could have been a lot different. So uh, sort of on the right idea for picking the objective, but still a bit of a mistake. Uh, yeah. Uh, here's just a better picture of the um, what Confluence of Magic is. So for those of you who don't know, you place each of you places three objective tokens, and when a unit overlaps the objective token, they get it, and it allows them to use a skill to recast uh, a number of the tokens equal to the objective tokens you have. So it's pretty powerful actually, and again, as I say, sort of a mistake for, for picking that, but it doesn't really end up getting me that bad. There are the three overgrowth. He get Now he gets an overgrowth from both the Verdant Sorceress and the Support Scion, so that's why he has three. So hilarious setup. This is, this is the official setup, and you can see that I've kind of placed the tokens. Um, you can see there's one right by his hand in the kind of right side and two in front, and um, he has placed mine. I mean, it's kind of hard to see, a bit of a cluttered table, but in the very end, in the top left, he's just placed one, two, three in a row, and um, I just was like, you know what, I'm not going to bother. So I completely ignore the objective tokens um, and deploy however I want anyway. Now, he has 
deployed extremely defensively, as you can see. Um, kind of, ex you know, as we talked about after the match, expecting me to just come in there and get shot at and whatever. Uh, and that's not exactly how it goes. I mean, if any of you have played against Y car players, you know that they're a bit, uh, they're defensive themselves. They like to turtle up, so guilty as charged, I guess. And here's just a shot from the other side, so you can see that what I'm talking about, his deployment of the objective tokens, and uh, I just decided to put that terrain, uh, the elevated terrain, completely out of play. So we're basically playing a skirmish with 200 points just with the size of our battlefield. So round one, and, and this is the rune cast I was talking about, so fortunately for me, I got two reds, which benefits the fire runes on my archers, and I may not have had any red runes, and again, didn't really think about it when I picked Confluence of Magic. It would have been a nightmare if I had no red runes, and all the tokens that I could have got to recast were on the far side of the battlefield. I mean, what a... pretty stupid. But I get two blue, which is good for my Maru resurrection, uh, but it's also good for his Scion shield. And one green, which is better than a poke in the eye. So, uh... My opponent is counting this turn, but I get first go, and I'm just uh, rallying, shielding, not really wanting to move. I'm going to see what he does. And he's just kind of shifting around with his scions here. This first turn's kind of uh, feeling each other out. I move forward and shield with my lancer on the right side of the table. He's kind of, you know, doing the same thing in the back line with his four block of archers there. Now I do try and get a um, get some blight out there, but he didn't move forward as aggressively as I thought he may. I thought he might come forward onto that objective token. And uh, Liana comes forward pretty aggressively. Again, she can't be targeted by my ranged attacks, so she's fairly safe. Um, blight tokens are kind of the only thing that might get her. The Scion uh, is moving around. Yeah. Now this is kind of a cool, um, a cool ability here. I show his support Scion card because um, after the activation, uh, if you are in range of overgrowth terrain, you can actually perform another shift. So essentially what he's doing here is a shift one, reform, shift one. And that's actually a pretty cool movement. Um, I, I enjoyed that a lot and uh, I mean, those damn elves, they're so maneuverable. The white car are just like a bunch of... God, they're so slow. So he uh, just does the double shift forward with the uh, Leongs and just decides to go basically two forward. And I go really forward with my archers. Um, I just wanted to get in range of something. Because in my mind, like, you know, they're my damage dealers, they've got range. He's kind of boxed himself in, and so... My archers are in a pretty good spot, like they've got a good firing arc here. And uh, again, I mean, I'm just planning on resurrecting him, so if he wants to go toe-to-toe, -to -toe, like, I'm okay with it, so. So my Death Knights, I just decide to rally and uh, wait. Um, again, I kind of use them reaction, like as a reaction unit in this game, and I figured the more um, inspiration tokens I have on them, the better, you know, I can refresh their, uh, or I can remove any... Uh, immobilization or whatever he applies on me later. So, so round two, ruins are unchanged. No one has used the skill. Uh, and I will point out that um, his Leonx riders, he deployed them in the kind of bottom right area of his deployment zone, and there was a token nearby, and he never actually goes and gets the token. And if he had got it first turn um, and started using it, I think it would have benefited him greatly. Uh, we had talked about this after the match, and um, because one of the ruins is a double red, uh, a double red, and the opposite side is the green, and now I benefit from the green in that I regenerate reanimates. But he benefits from the green because it affects his verdant sorceress and his overgrowth terrain, and even the shifting of some of his units is impacted by green. So to take away my damage and aid him, I think would have been very smart. Um, so I open up with uh, my carrying lancer who's just reforming, and the reason is is I'm just lining up my firing arc with the uh, with the spikes there, 
and thinking about a counter charge if uh, Ileana comes in on my archers. So this is the scions just moving forward based on the green runes. Nothing special. Uh, my archers do tee off on his scion and these guys do have uh, so they have three armor because they have one and then two from the blue runes and then he armors up again here for four so you know despite my armors do or my archers doing six damage you know I only hit him for one wound so very resilient and that's my fire uh, rune attack and of course it just does two and that's not enough to get through so I hit him with a blight with my carrying lancer and uh, so this was interesting. He he shifts and reforms, and it's okay that he hits his target, but basically now he's poking out, um, you know, aiming at my archers. And this this would have been a pretty good play because I'm counting this turn, so he would get to shoot on me first next turn. However, because of my Raven Tabard, I actually shoot at initiative four, so... Uh, and these guys are just... I mean, these archers are so far in the back, and he had to fit so many units into this small deployment area. You know, it's hard to get some use out of these guys, so they're just kind of, you know, doing their own thing. Just kind of hopping back and forth, basically. Uh, so this is a, you know, classic elf move. So he's kind of out in front, aiming at my archers, or facing my archers, and he kind of decides to pull back. So he does this, you know, shift two, shift one, and now he's kind of put himself out of range of my, you know, my potential threats. Um, you know, a bit, a bit of waffling. I, I, I don't think his Ileana should have come in. I mean, if she came in on my archers, she's like alone. You know, she's a one-man army out there, and she would have been in some trouble. Uh, so I guess pulling back is not a bad idea. I don't know. Tr he was in a tricky situation there. It's funny how. Um, playing the patient game like someone I guess has to give and even though he deployed defensively he started to give in to coming out to fight and I think that was sort of influenced by the fact that my archers were in a really good position uh, like they covered so much of the battlefield I mean he only had like two ways to exit and they had they had line of sight on both ways to exit so yeah again this uh, this was an interesting play now he has teed up a huge movement on his Leonx riders. And I guess he decided that with the positioning of my Death Knights and the Carrion Lancer, this he didn't want to do this anymore. And so he actually shifts his Scion into the path of his Leonx riders, and it stops them from going because they will out, uh, they have to overlap Eliana and the Scion. And so it basically cancels out their movement. So it may look like a misplay, but it actually was kind of cool. Um, a nice way to mitigate, you know, a decision you made that you no longer want to make. So well played by my opponent there. I, I haven't really thought about moving my um, moving my trays in that way. Usually it's an accident, and you're like, oh, I've totally screwed myself. But he actually wanted to stop the movement, so that's awesome. Uh, I'm just shifting and skilling, and so at this point, all I'm doing with my reanimates is I'm trying to pick the initiative where I will be able to resurrect the most archers if they take damage. So I was expecting his Eliana to charge. I had teed off a late resurrection so that I could bring them back, uh, but he ended up not coming in, so fair enough. And so here's that play I'm talking about. He was going for a four charge, uh, which might have put him in a bit of a tricky situation and instead he just bumps and cancels so good good play and uh, and it's a good play because my death knights uh, dialed in a late movement reform so if you can imagine his leonx charging through the objective token as you can see coming right in front of my reanimates they would have been smashed by my death knights. I mean my death knights were in perfect position to obliterate them so yeah good good save. So the runes aren't changing no one's got those tokens thank god. <laughs> um, so his scion here is just again getting that early movement off getting that defense up. Four armor I mean he's a tough nut to crack. 
Uh, I'm reforming, and the reason I'm reforming is because I'm not too uh, enticed to put Blight tokens on this Scion, and the reason is he's got, you know, the Verdant Sorceress, the Rallying Starling, I mean, they're going to come off. And also, I don't really care. I mean, whatever, this Scion's not going to do damage. So I've actually reformed myself because I'm expecting Aliana to come into the terrain, possibly, and then come out of the terrain. Um, one movement, like one skill or a tip in Rune Wars is cavalry units who have a movement on their first dial and a movement on their second dial, if you run them into a terrain and then the second dial makes them exit the terrain, I mean, you can move huge distances. I mean, imagine, for example, if you hit that elevated terrain, you know, you could essentially move four spaces to the terrain, move the distance of the terrain, and exit on the other side. Uh, so it's actually a pretty, it's a pretty cool tip, and one that we kind of were just thinking about at this moment. So that's why I've lined him up like this. And he does actually enter the terrain, but he doesn't exit it, uh, as I thought he may. Uh, so my archers are shooting at his archers here, and uh, pretty good. I mean, I hit him for uh, six damage on the first volley, and then with my fire rune I do another two. So all in I take off eight, and pretty good. And you can see now, or you will see in the turns to come, how valuable this support scion is, uh, and holding his threat at three. So he tees off on my Carrion Lancer, and so each hit does three damage. So he does three hits, which is uh, nine damage. No, nine damage, yep. Yeah. But because I had uh, shielded, he doesn't kill me, which is great. Now here he's moving his bumped scion um, to the side. I think he's trying to make room for his Leonx to get in the fight. I just blight his Eliana. I mean, whatever. Speed bump. Nothing nothing to see here, folks. <laughs> um, and so he does shift his Leonx to the side and reform them. So I think now he's thinking he's going to come out around the side. Uh, and so my Death Knights, I... Like, I didn't want to commit. I didn't want to, like, charge the terrain that Eliana was in because it would put me in range of his archers. So I was just like... I guess I'm just gonna stay put. So I just rally up again. <laughs> they're kinda like they're in a really good position. You can't quite see it here. Maybe we will on the overarching shot, but like we've got battle lines and the Death Knights are like right in the middle. So if he crosses into like the neutral zone, I mean they're gonna they're gonna get in there, so And same thing here, like I kinda thought Eliana might charge or whatnot, so nothing. I haven't resurrected anyone yet. I mean it's been a pretty, it's been a fairly uneventful game so far. Lots of posturing. So here I'm just showing the power of the Verdant Sorceress, Rallying Starling. So he removes three Blight tokens from Eliana. So, you know, what's the point of Blighting? Fortunately, my list wasn't really built on Blighting, but still, that's amazing. And then he readies the Tempered Steel on the uh, other group of archers there. So here's the overarching shot, and uh, you can see what I'm talking about, about those Death Knights. I mean, if anyone comes into that zone, you know, you're in trouble. And they're really well protected by those spikes, and the archers aren't in range, and yeah, like, I'm pretty happy with my positioning. And the truth is, like, if he wants to trade with my archers, I'm just going to resurrect them. His maximum damage is 9 from his archers. It's not enough to kill my back rank. Uh, and therefore, I can just replenish them. So, feeling pretty good. So, same thing. Shield reform. I just want to prolong my life. I mean, theoretically, if you had a terrible roll, I guess I could have lived. So, my archers are shooting his. And, uh, good hit. But, basically, you know, that Scion is stubborn. Three armor back there. And, uh, so I do two wounds. And I don't get the double hit on my fire rune, which is the only way I could have done another wound is with yeah the double hit, which is pretty rare. Now I was pretty stoked about this move here. Um, maneuvering templates is 
unforgiving. You know, like, you pick a move, you think it's going to work, you put down the template, and you're like, oh god, what have I done? But here, this is exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to take my Carrying Lancer, line him up for a counter charge, because again, I mean, this time for real, I thought Eliana was going to come out of the train. So he just polishes off my Carrying Lancer on the far side, and fare thee well, friend, you... You were a pincushion. Uh, this is kind of um, hard to see, but he actually does a nice play and positions his scion for charging my reanimates the next turn. Um, I move my reanimates forward. I, I don't know. I'm not really sure what I was hoping for. I kind of thought, like, if my carrying lancer dies, I want to kind of be able to plug the hole with these guys, so I move them forward. And it kind of kind of screwed me up a little bit. So, we'll see. Uh, his Scion's just trudging forward. I think he now at this point is thinking, you know, he wants to get that uh, that objective token, maybe use it a couple times. But, you know, we're pretty late in the turn, so, or in the, in the game. Uh, and this is some, this is some tricksy stuff right here. So he shifts out, and if you shift out of a terrain, your side or front edge actually have to be touching. So he shifts out sideways and shifts one to kind of put himself in position of my carrion lancer. And again, I can't shoot him. He's got that um, ambush predator, so... Um, his archers are just refreshing stuff and whatever. I mean, the truth is that they just don't really do much this game. Um, a bit of an expensive unit for like bane removal, I guess. Yeah. And so this was silly of me, but I don't get punished too heavily. I collide with my reanimates with my death knights, and I uh, am able to reform though, so that I'm not actually. I can move next turn without being hindered by them. So that was lucky. This could have been a big mistake. So here's the kind of final shot. And things are about to get pretty explosive uh, in this coming round. Uh, lots of posturing. I think he just kind of realized that I had him trapped with my archers and uh, was doing... Yeah, I was going to win the War of Attrition. So it's turn 5, which means that he counts first. So it's kind of important. Especially when, you know, when you're on the verge of, of charging and whatnot. So I just rally and shield because... I thought he was going <laughs> to I thought he was going to charge my carrion lancer. And I could have originally like I could have rallied and moved and engaged him and tried to lock him up, but then I kind of thought he might expect that and attack. And I mean, this is where the subtlety of Rune Wars really gets gets you going. So I decide to be the speed bump and we'll see if it pays off. Uh, so he does charge my archers, and he gets a flank. I believe I use a blight to cancel out one of his extra dice. I think I do, so he loses a blue dice he chooses. And he only does three, so that's pretty lucky. Could have been worse. Uh, I decide to shoot his scion. Again, I have close card uh, quarters com uh, targeting, and I kill him, so thank god. He shoots my... Or no, sorry, I'm using my fire rune to hit his archers. And again, that scion is absorbing the damage, so I don't have enough to do the armor. Uh, so the scion remains with two wounds on him, and his threat three is preserved. So I'm liking that scion pick quite a bit, actually. Now he fires back with his archers, and it's a good hit. So he does use tempered steel, and he gets the two hits. So I believe that's nine damage. Yeah, you can see I've lost nine, so... Ouch. Um, his scion kind of does a charge up to the right. Now that's the biggest, pardon me, the biggest turn that the scion can do. And you'll see why he does that. I mean, he's in a great position to block the death knights, but, you know, you'll see. Uh, so this was unexpected. It's turn five, so Eliana does five lethal for sure. And she does this unexpected shift to charge, which, I mean, 
this is something the Waikar only dream of. I mean, you would never expect to charge backwards or whatever she does. I mean, it's just hilarious. So she charges my reanimates. She for sure does five damage. Then she does uh, eight, and then she has a lethal and a mortal wound or something. So in the end, I think she does, what is that, uh, eight damage total, uh, which was very effective. I mean, I was... This makes a big difference, right? Because... If she hadn't have attacked my archers, I would have maintained my threat and been able to resurrect, but this leads to one of the most awkward resurrections you've ever seen in your life. Not to mention she gets the Flea and Terror, and uh, what the Flea and Terror does is it, you know, they reform you and march you too, and so he basically marches me towards his archers and away from my allies, so pretty devastating actually. Good job, Eliana. This is a awful shot and I apologize it's like <laughs> it hurts the eyes so I'll be quick he basically dialed in a huge charge with his Leonx and he actually sneaks by that scion very good um, estimation of movement by my opponent but he comes short of the carrion lancer who he was trying for and just to um, impress upon you the potential amazing play here if he had connected with my lancer killed it he could have reformed and, you know, been in a great position, so good try. And my uh, my reanimates here are doing the late movement and resurrection. Had I been a bit quicker, this could have made a huge difference. I, again, I wasn't expecting Eliana to charge the reanimates, so now you can see my reanimates are a one tray wide, three deep, so that's awkward. <laughs> Uh, and these guys are, you know, his archers are just trying to get into the fight, basically. So this was a good play, uh, or rather, I shouldn't say a good play, this was a, an annihilation. But I charge his scion with my death knights, and I crush him. I mean, I've got Duskblade, so he's got a shield of two, I guess it is. Or three, maybe, but it doesn't matter, I just wipe him out. So that was good. I get an immobilization token, because that's how the Scions roll. They are the expert speed bumps. The Carrion Lancers are kind of wannabe speed bumps. And here's the final uh, shot of the round. So things are heating up. My archers look ridiculous. Uh, my Carrion Lancer is in a great position to be a speed bump. But, uh, yeah, interesting plays coming up here. So turn six here. I'm counting first. Ruins are unchanged. So I'm not showing you... I, I missed a photo here, and that is that my Carrion Lancer is... Um, <clears throat> pardon me. My Carrion Lancer is rallying and shielding, and that's because I expected the Leonx or Eliana to come in and attack him. And what this would have allowed for my opponent is because he has that... Um, Raven Tabard, which decreases the initiative of his Leonx. Uh They actually, because I chose to initiate my Lancer first, they could have chose to charge my Lancer. And if they had done that and killed him, they could have reformed and potentially have dodged my Death Knight's charge. However, he had forgotten that, that he could have acted at initiative 3, and so as a result, my Death Knights connect with him and roll a massive roll. I mean, it's uh, uh, 8 damage. I reduce his armor by 1. I kill his whole unit in one go. I mean, awesome. And I do, of course, use, uh, at the beginning of the turn, I used um, uh, the Inspiration token to remove the Immobilize of the Scion. So, good play. Uh, could have gone differently if, you know, everyone had been aware of what upgrades were in play. It's hard to keep track when you're staring down, uh, you know, staring staring at death in the face, so. Uh, his guys are, you know, coming coming in, trying to get into the action. So my archers, which are now a 1 by 3 significantly less terrifying, try to kill his Scion, and, you know, I get three rerolls, or two rerolls, which is exciting, I guess, but anyway, I do get the accuracy token, token so I apply it to his um, Blackthorn Assassin, and uh, my Fire Rune here does nothing, so that Scion is just resilient. I'm jealous. 
Um, so he shoots my reanimates and takes out four. Uh, good for him. Yep, definitely they're in a tough situation. Uh, but the tricky thing here is that I did time my resurrection well. So even though he kills a unit of my reanimates, I get to resurrect them right after they take damage. So I bring them back. They're still a glorious phalanx of a, of a one by three. So good. And then he comes in with Ileana and attacks and kills five. So he was trying to, as best he could, synchronize the attacks between his archer and his Aliana to take out all of the archers to prevent the resurrection. Um, but, you know, I was lucky in that I managed to squeak it in there and preserve them. And again, he's using this backwards charge, so very cool. And at this point, um, my opponent decides to concede. Um, you know, he is in a tough position here, and uh, the rationale was that I could resurrect my archers again next turn before he could attack, and the cycle would continue. And uh, those archers were just so resilient, and he invested a lot of resources into trying to take them out, and they didn't get taken out, and my death knights just basically were coming in for the flank show on his whole army. And it's hard to say how the match would have turned out, it's, you know, next turn was turn seven, so I kind of doubt that he would have been able to out, you know, outdo me in points. Eliana was not in a great position, to say the least, and his archers, you know, they would need to come up. They would have been able to fire on turn eight, his uh, four blocks, so they were, they were a very expensive blight removal tool, and they didn't do a whole lot uh, in this matchup. So I hope you enjoyed the battle report. I just wanted to go through some final thoughts on the battle that we just saw. So firstly, the confluence of magic is uh, a very interesting uh, objective card. Um, I think it's pretty risky to pick if your damage is dependent on the runes, such as my uh, fire rune was. Uh, however, I think it's a very good pick if you are uh, more, you know, your runes are more defensive, uh, they don't impact you as, as much as like a fire rune does. I also think they're very important, uh, or it's a good choice, if you are hemmed in. If your opponent picks a, um, a formation for you so that you're boxed into a deployment zone, then he has to put those um, objective tokens close by you. And if they do, and you pick them up early, you can seriously impact how the ruins turn. Um, if my opponent had started changing the ruins right away, I mean, this game could have gone quite a bit differently. So I think I've gained some respect for the Confluence of Magic, and uh, I definitely would encourage people to try it. If you're fighting somebody, uh, well, basically, if you're the Dakan, you could definitely benefit from manipulating ruins so that your uh, enemy, you know, so that you have like two blanks or whatever, you know, keep those runes away from them, I think is, uh, would be really awesome. The second thing I really enjoyed about this last game was um, just how creative the Latari are. I mean, by contrast, the Y-Car are such a, um, you know, they're pretty standard. They move in standard ways. They, nothing's like exciting per se. Like you, you look at them and you, you know what they're going to bring to the table. But the Latari are just so, it's so interesting. I love that their archers have a, you know, two four, uh, two four block formations that have different uh, upgrades available. I think that's a really cool theme. I really like how they can do charges sideways. I love the shift shift. I mean, it really, uh, I think Latari players can really use that to their advantage because trust me, like, I've played the Latari three times now, and I'm just starting to think about all these crazy movements. Uh, for example, when he uh, charged my archers with his side when I thought he was coming at my carrion lancer. Very cool. One learning experience from this game is the potential for terrain to allow you to advance on your opponent quickly. So let's say, for example, um, your opponent is... Uh, or let's say, for example, that your opponent is first player, and you have a cavalry unit, and you, on your turn, dial in a four movement into terrain, and then dial in a two movement on your second dial to exit the terrain. 
Well, now you've just traveled I'm quite a huge distance, uh, and you're through the terrain, and you are counting first next turn. So it really does bring you close. I think using terrain in this way is something I hadn't really considered until this game, and something I very much look forward to doing, uh, especially with my Death Knights who have the ability to do that. Um, not really any other uh, Y-Car unit can do that. I mean, Maru could or whatever, but none that I would want to put in such danger. So. If you see an opponent's unit vulnerable by terrain, certainly consider this option because it's uh, pretty deadly. The last thing I just want to talk about is the archer build that I used in this game, which was influenced by the Y card player who made it farthest in the worlds. I mean, it's such a uh, versatile build and, uh, you know, resilient. Um, you know, he, the, the player in the worlds, was very, uh, his his tactic was seriously damaged when he uh, had to do a, a, a panic check and lost, you know, his opponent chose to took away, uh, take away close quarters uh, targeting. So, I mean, that, that sealed the deal. But if you keep close quarters targeting and you're resurrecting your units, I mean, this build is very strong. And it answers that age-old question of how many archers does a reanimate, uh, does a Y-card player need? And the answer is all of them. You need all of the Archer units. All of them. Well, I hope you enjoyed episode 4 of the Rune Wars Battlecast. Please consider liking and subscribing to the video. Uh, your feedback is always appreciated. And uh, keep playing Rune Wars, and I'll see you again very soon.